I want to acknowledge the local Indigenous people of the land and pay my respects to the elders, um, both past and present. Um, but more importantly, I do want to acknowledge everyone of you in the room for coming along and spending time to listen to somebody like me drone on about stuff. So thank you so much. I hope I'm going to um, teach you some lessons and um, inspire you and, and um, tell you a little bit about my story and what it, I guess it all means um, under the context of, of women's empowerment in particular. Um, Irene's right, I mean, the Entre Hub um, as an organisation um, has been built around entrepreneurship, but the reality is, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, uh, is that when you realise that women are the backbone of the economy, whether it be Australia or the United States, then it stands to reason that the majority of our members are going to be women. And why? Because when you realise, and the penny drops, that small business is in fact the backbone of any economy, and they understand who runs small business, well, men might run the banks and the mining companies, but the reality is the true backbone of this economy, the US economy, the European economy, is small business. So it stands to reason that our, um, our, our largest base are women around the world. It also stands to reason that my advisory board, I think we've got one male, um, David sometimes feels a little bit out of place, um, but they're women because, um, not, not because small business is run by women, but because these, these ladies are, are pretty influential, powerful, successful human beings. Um, I've got a lady called Hadida El Mashri from the Gold States on the advisory board who's the founder of the Emirates Group. Um, now, if you understand a little bit more about what Habiba does um, out of Dubai and into Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and other places, it's about empowering women to let loose the cloth and think that they not only have a place in the world, but that place is around leadership. Um, or uh, Freda Miraculous, the, um, the Global President of Business and Professional Women International, for or former now, for obvious reasons. Um, and the list goes on and on. Noreen Young, the Chief Executive of Australia's um, Diversity Council, um, is also on the advisory board. So, um, I already gave you a bit of a snapshot about that membership, that's why the membership exists in the way it is. So today, um, I decided that I wanted to talk to you about um, not working for the man anymore, but it's more about me as well, because um, I'm completely unemployable now. I can never go and work for anybody ever again, because you know what, I just don't care what people think of what I'm about to say, because it's what I feel and what I've experienced and what I've done. Um, so it's not only that I encourage you to think that you no longer have to work for the man anymore, I don't work for the man anymore too, so it makes us equal partners, right? I'm, I'm just saying. But what I'm going to do is I want to start off by telling you my backstory um, and um, why I'm standing here and, and where I've come to this place that, um, that I am today and where I'm going to. And then I want to share some lessons that I've learned along the way. So I'm not going to talk to you about statistics, about um, pay equity and all those sorts of things. You all know those figures, and we just don't need to go there. But I want to inspire you through my own journey, because I think my journey is very similar to a number of other people in this room too. So to set the scene, um, I want to tell you a couple of things. Um, when I arrived here in Australia, um, I came with a Bank of New Zealand credit card that I haven't paid back. Uh, I've never been overseas before, um, and the only difference between me and somebody who has arrived by boat is I came on an New Zealand 737. Pretty simple, really, and I'll tell you now, um, had I not been from New Zealand, I would have tried by hook or by crook to get out of the situation I was to build a better life for me and my family. It just so happened, I came on a 737. Um, I had a backpack, um, I had a woolly jumper, the sun in November in Australia was really hot, um, I come from a little place in New Zealand that's really cold. Uh, and uh, the truth is, I didn't even know if I was going to make it. Um, I stayed in a dodgy motel on Crown Street in Surrey Hills, and it was like 25 bucks a night. Um, the next door neighbour was shooting up on drugs every other night, and the other next door neighbour was, shall we say, um, hosting uh, men on a regular basis. I was scared, I had no one, I didn't know anybody, but I thought, bugger it, I'm going to make it really good guy. So my story is not too dissimilar from a lot of other people that seek out opportunity because you know what, we just want to be better than we um, find ourselves in when we're born or whatever our circumstances are. The other thing you need to know about me is I'm a proud Maori from New Zealand. Um, my daughter, my first language is Maori. My second language is English. And I'm proud of the people um, that have given me the culture, the identity um, that I have. And, being half Māori, half Irish, the gift of the gap had to come from my mother's side. You know, flowers on the side. Which means also, you know, when, when it's a Friday night, 
one half of me wants to go to the pub, the other one doesn't want to come home. So it doesn't matter what time it's all about, we're on the same day. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, first of all, my, my little backstory, just to set the scene, and about how I became the person I am today and the, the role that entrepreneurship has played in, in my life. So the story began when I was eight years old. Um, my first business was as a museum director. Um, basically, it involved stealing all mum's really fancy jewellery um, and all those little knick-knacky china things that she had in her cabinet. And we set up a stall in the backyard and we treated it like a museum. And I was eight years old, we ended up burying it as a treasure hunt. So, you know, we haven't found the stuff again, we buried it so good. So I just thought, probably, you know, after mum gave a bit of a slap on the backside, that probably being a museum director was going to be out of the question. So at 10, I wanted to be a chemist. Now, as things go, my mind works in a funny little way. So basically, um, my, I decided that because my brother um, knew something about chemicals, probably for the wrong reasons, um, that there was a potential business in that. And when I found out that probably some of it was unlawful, I thought, OK, no, being a chemist is probably not going to be for me. So at 12, I decided I still wanted to be a businessman, and I still wanted to earn a lot of money. Now, the reason I, I wanted to be that businessman is because, look, my mum and dad worked really hard, really hard for what they had. They both worked two jobs each. Mum at the local RSA, which is the RSL here, and she worked at the Ministry of Transport during the day. Dad was a rubber worker at the Dunlop's Tire Factory, and he did briefing over the weekends. So I saw how they struggled um, to put food on the table, and, you know, I had a beautiful childhood, but I saw the struggle, and I didn't want that for my own family, and I didn't want that for me. So at 12 years old, I um, discovered in my grandfather's garage all these Hessian sacks, you know, potato sacks, what potatoes used to come in. And so um, I got together with my old brother Reuben and we um, went up into the uh, reserve bush and we had pine cones everywhere, so we, we bagged up all these pine cones and we sold them on the streets for $10 a bag of fire. And that was pretty cool, that was pretty cool. We, um, we branched out a little bit later and because uh, Nana had these plastic potholes in the, in the garage as well. Anyway, so we went and pitched all down as pot, hold, uh, uh, pot plant holders and we uh, uh, went into the reserves, we'd call it a, a national forest, I'm just over here, wouldn't you? And we picked up all these native plants and we repotted them and we went around and we sold these, these pot plants until the local council caught up with us <laughs> and uh, we discovered that was a bit of an illegal venture as well. Uh, but hey, it was profitable for a time. It was a, it was, it was a lot of fun. We made a lot of money that was spent on, on a lot of good food. <laughs> I've always been a bit round, you see. <laughs> at 16, um, I was at uh, a school in Upper Hutt, New Zealand called St Patrick's, and, and this was my really first big business failure. Uh, we had part of our business studies course was to build a business. And so me and my mates came up with this grand idea. Boxer shorts were big back then, right? You know, patterns on boxer shorts and things like that. Anyway, so um, being a sales guy, I, I rang um, Haynes, the boxer short company in Wellington, and I said, hey, you know, this is what we're thinking. And well, Haynes just basically sent us all these free samples. So we thought, well, we've got our stock now. We can start selling these samples. <laughs> Unfortunately, the business just really took off, and um, of course, we took in a lot of money. And when the samples ran out, we found ourselves in a little bit of trouble. And it was a, it was a very interesting experience because when you've got people that you've sold a product to, you don't quite have to stop. You learn a few lessons about customer relations. <laughs> even at 16, at 17, I still wanted to be something more than I really was, and I was trying a whole lot of things. And look, let's face it: school didn't agree with me, and I didn't agree with school. It's a simple reality. Some kids aren't built for school, um, and I certainly was one of them. Um, so at 17, I thought, oh, I got this. I'm going to move to the big smoke, then called Auckland. There are, I've since obviously moved to the biggest smoke in Auckland. And, um, and so I, I decided I didn't know anybody. I was in the big world, out of this little town in an upper hut. And I thought, well, I'll meet some people. How can I do that? Well, I'll run for student politics. Um, and at 17, I became the youngest student union president in New Zealand history. Um, and my campaign slogan was fairly simple, vote for me and my dad will buy you beer. <laughs> now that's a promise every politician can keep. I didn't promise infrastructure, I didn't promise anything of nonsense, I just promised beer and my market just voted for me and it was wonderful. 
So it was 1993, I was 18 years old, and, um, and you know, I was raging against the machine a little bit. University didn't agree with me, just like school didn't agree with me. And so I met this fellow called uh, Winston Peters, who's um, a deputy prime minister, used, used to be deputy prime minister of New Zealand, uh, a bit naughty on Winston, he, he's a bit disruptive in New, in New Zealand politics as well. So I thought, oh, bugger it, I'm running for parliament. Who doesn't run for parliament? Everybody does that, right? Why not? So I, uh, I ran for the seat of Otara in South Auckland, and of course I didn't quite win, which was probably the best thing ever. I mean, I still just didn't have enough life experience to be a politician, but God, it was fun. You walk around South Auckland and they had these hoardings with your face all over it, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And I sneak back to the student pub and had a couple more beers. Uh, between the ages of 90 and 23, though, um, I kind of like my dream was dead and dying a little bit. Um, I found myself um, involved in what we call family business, also known as social welfare. Uh, and I ended up um, granting unemployment benefits, just, uh, domestic purposes benefits, self-hearing income, those sorts of things. Um, and it was a real lesson in life for me because I saw that I wasn't the only one facing difficult circumstances. The very people that were in front of me were coming in for food grants and clothing allowances. And you know, while there were probably some people taking advantage of the system, the truth is, the people that were sitting in front of me, the stories were really confronting. Uh, I decided to get out of the wealthy business and I decided to get into the banking business. I mean, why not? So I became a personal banker with the Bank of New Zealand um, in Upper Hutt. Uh, and I found myself going from one form of welfare to another, which was giving people mortgages um, that were then going to tie themselves up for about 40 or even 50 years in some cases. And, and there wasn't much difference between granting somebody an unemployment benefit or a food grant and listening to the pain and the trouble that people were going through and just putting um, the mortgage payment through their bank account. And so I decided, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And I thought, bugger it, I'm out of here. And I left, I left New Zealand for the big wide world of Australia. Now, when I got to Australia, like I said before, it didn't matter how I was going to get here, I was still going to get here. And I argue even today, whether it was a 737 or a boat, I would have found my way to Sydney. And that's what happened. So when I got here, um, I've already told you I didn't know anybody. Um, I know a lot more people now, which is really cool. We have a lot of fun times. Um, but basically, um, when I got to Australia, as I said before, I had a credit card. And that was, a, that was literally a, I didn't even have enough money to go past one week within here. What I had done, and I don't advocate you do this, but he has become my, my best and greatest friend. I thought, how can I try and stitch up a job before I even get here by making the recruitment agent think that I'm already there? So I put on an Australian accent, I picked up my mum's phone, and I ran this recruitment company called ITT Recruitment, and I got this um, guy on the other end, and I kind of felt recruitment agents were a bit stupid, which would bode me well later on when you hit the largest vampire in the company. And uh, his name was Justin Whelan, a remarkable individual, but I had convinced him that we'd had beer at the pub um, the week before. <laughs> now, now, keep in mind, I had never been out of New Zealand in my life. <laughs> but Justin bought into it, uh, and he lined up a series of interviews for me, and by the time I was done with Justin, I managed to get my first job. And it was with a company, the sister company of the recruitment company called ITNT Education. Now, I didn't know anyone, keep in mind, and uh, I was at a Christmas party in my first year. Um, the managing director was over in the corner, so I thought, bugger it, why not go and tell him what I really think of his business, which I did. Fortunately for me, he felt the same about the performance of the company. Um, and I get it. just to step back a bit, when I was back in New Zealand, I was on like twenty-five dollars to $30,000 New Zealand a year. Right? Um, when I got to Australia, that first job paid me $65,000 plus this magic thing called superannuation. Um, and I thought, wow, I really hit the jackpot on that one, haven't I? I mean, you could buy the little vibe on basically $65,000, sorry for the key was in the room. Anyway, uh, so um, I, I had this conversation with the owner of the company, and all of a sudden I found myself as the state manager of, um, of his business. And he gave me a really important job to do, and that was to reform the business and put it back on the right tracks. Now, keep in mind, I'm not a university qualified person, and so everything I was doing at the time was kind of like a little bit made up, but it made perfect sense to me, because how could I be wrong? It's logical to do stuff 
we overcomplicate things so often that become this big jumbled mess, whereas it should be fairly simple um, when, you, when you start out. Um, that said, um, I learned a couple of things, I met a couple of people, and uh, with a few friends of mine from that business, we started our first um, company in Australia called DataTech. And DataTech was a really interesting experiment because, keep in mind, I've never been in information technology before, and so I thought, well, what the heck? How hard can this thing be? I mean, nobody else knows about technology, right? I mean, we're talking about the early years of the 2000s when the internet was only just starting to really come along. And this is a lesson that I've learned, which I'll, I'll tell you now. As long as you're one chapter ahead of the book that everybody else is reading, you're guaranteed to be successful. It doesn't mean that you're making it up. It sometimes means, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But, I mean, that is a really important lesson for people to learn. You don't have to be on the same page as everybody else as long as you're one chapter ahead. And you know what we call those people? Inventors, innovators, disruptors. Somebody had to disrupt the market. Somebody had to invent something. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. So that's, a, I think, a great simple advice. Um, the following year, we actually opened Australia's first online retail site. Now, yeah, it's long gone, um, and we called it samsungconsumables.com. Because we've done this deal with Samsung um, to host this joint conference around knowledge management. And it was just a wonderful experience. The business was a complete failure, I would add, and I'll get to that after. Um, but I met um, who was to become my future business partner, partner in crime, um, 2IC, 3IC, and his name is Austin Kim. Um, and Austin's down at the back of the room, and Austin, like me, is a migrant to Australia. So the business, even though it ended up being a complete failure that did teach me a few lessons, I met somebody who was going to come on a journey with me now for the rest of our lives. I met my future business partner, Austin. Um, in 2002, after leaving DataTech, um, I joined with two other IT people, because then I knew a little bit about information technology. I didn't know a hell of a lot, but uh, I still knew a lot more than everybody else did. And we then set up a, uh, a new company called Sympathy. So I'm already on to my second startup in Australia after learning some lessons from the first. Um, after trying to buy Alpha West, now, okay, I want to be really clear. Even back then, I still didn't have any money. But I managed to network with these people and form connections with these people. And all of a sudden, we're buying, we're putting a bid in to buy this company for $14 million. <laughs> I still haven't paid that Bank of New Zealand credit card back. I had a student loan, and I still need to finalise from the New Zealand government. But I, I still had no money, and all of a sudden we were stitching up this deal to buy a company for $40 million. It was just incredible to me. Now, thank God the market collapsed before the deal went through, so we were only we going to get out of it. And that was the big IT bust in the early 2000s. So I learned some lessons from that experience as well. What I learned from that experience is how to raise finance and how to raise capital, because I used my eyes to watch what was going on around me, and that really is the second lesson. Always be observant. Don't think that you know everything. Listen to what's being said by people who know more than you do about a particular subject. In 2003, I founded my own consulting company because I thought, how hard can this be? And I called it Sans Man. Now, I don't know if people know the, the French word um, for without, um, but basically, I decided I'm going to call it without government. Um, and that's because I wanted to rage against the machine a little bit about the, the challenge that we had at the time, the government were just running everything, um, and business, small business players like me were the side. So I created the first consulting company called Sans Man, and that's still going today. And by 2008, I was the head of the world's largest and oldest employment company, Drake International. Who would have thought this little old Maori boy from the boondocks of Upper Hutt after, what, less than 10 years in Australia would be the head of this multi-billion dollar global corporation? Now, I still pinch myself because I think that's pretty cool. But how I, but how I did it um, was, was really interesting. I've never been short of telling the truth. Um, you've got to be direct with people, otherwise you waste your time and you waste everybody else's time. So I get this phone call from a, a really interesting fellow called Bill Pollock. Now, I didn't know much about recruitment other than the scam I run 10 years earlier on my mate Justin Whelan. Um, but he rang me, he heard about a little bit of the work that I had um, been doing, and, um, and he said to me, look, come down to Melbourne, um, I'd like you to sit on a meeting with me, uh, and uh, I've got a problem with my business. Now, I'd also never heard of Drake before. 
Anyway, so um, I said to him, well, look, I don't get out of here for free, so it'll cost you $385 an hour, minimum 7.5 hours per day, so it's two days and I'll charge you for the full week. Now, it just rolled off my tongue, it might be the gift for the damn thing. <laughs> but he said yes. Anyway, um, I get down to Melbourne, I'm sitting in the, uh, in the boardroom, he, all he wants me to do is listen, and I listen to all of these general managers just spout utter nonsense and crap. Uh, the business, um, Drake, was in serious trouble, um, it was an old brand, we basically trained our own competitor base over 60 years here in Australia, and what was happening in Australia was no different to what was happening in every other jurisdiction around the world that we operated in. And to give you guys a perspective on how big an old Drake was, um, for those of you familiar with Job Services Australia um, and the Job Network before it, before it was the Commonwealth Employment Service and it was effectively run by Drake over many years. So Bill says to me, so Matt, what do you think about um, my problem? And I said, well, I think I'd sack them all. He said, why would you sack them? And I said, because They've, they've blamed everybody else but themselves for the situation that we find themselves uh, ourselves in. And when you're on $250,000 a year, you know, you've got to take some kind of responsibility for what you've done. So uh, Bill said thank you. I went on my very way and I got a phone call about a week later and, and, um, and Bill says to me, look, why don't you come down and meet me again? And I said, look, you know, I kind of want to earn that money. Um, I don't see the purpose. I don't see the relevance. But he made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. And so I went down for another chat, and by the end of that week, um, I was the head of the company. Now, there's a lot more to it. Um, I'll eventually write a book, and hopefully somebody will buy it in you know, I don't know, a couple of years' time or something. But the complexity of where I arrived at was simply his business problem was that his people just didn't listen to the people that were around them. Uh, and given the fact that some of our branch managers um, had been with the company for more than 30 years, it stood to reason that why would you listen to a 24-year-old upstart, unless, you know, that's somebody like me, hopefully, um, versus somebody with a huge amount of experience. Um, and the valuation of older workers is, is something that I've been on ever since. Anyway, so uh, I said to Bill, I don't know anything about the recruitment market. Let's not let them know that the game is on just yet. And so um, for the uh, next 12 months, I was a receptionist in Darwin. I did blue collar recruitment out here in Parramatta. Um, I did payroll management in, uh, in Melbourne, and so nobody really knew who I was. I was just this temp that happened to float around the place. And in doing so, I listened to everything that was being said to me. I listened to the concerns and the gripes, mostly over Friday night drinks for all the action perks. Uh, and um, after 12 months, um, I went back um, over to Europe. I met with um, Bill Pollock, and he said to me, right, how do we fix this? And so I gave him a plan, and to put the plan into action, it required me to remove all of those general managers. So keep in mind that the business had been losing a significant amount of money over a long period of time, uh, and, uh, and basically, the only way it could be fixed is by showing the workforce that somebody actually now was in the role of listening to what they were telling them. And you know, it was during the global financial crisis, it was a really tough time, there was a lot of stress involved, um, but essentially that one thing that I did was a saver of the business. Yes, I cut costs and I did all the things that you would expect an individual to do, um, but I never closed one main main capital city branch or Hobart, um, and I certainly never laid off any frontline workers. What I did do was call all 11 of those general managers into one room over the period of a day and send them out the door. And I guess the, what I'm trying to get to with that example and that point in my career is I learned a significant amount about the engagement of people and connecting with people and listening to people. Because the truth is, it does not matter what business you're in, you've got to listen and take stock of whether or not people want to buy into who you are and what you do. So basically, um, I retired from Drake back in 2010, um, and Austin and I founded the Sustain Group, which is a social investment business. Um, and then in 2014, we did something even more remarkable, and that was found a global network of entrepreneurs because I thought there was a real gap in the market. Um, not because other people weren't talking about entrepreneurship, but I want to talk about entrepreneurship in a different way. I want to talk about the truth of entrepreneurship being about you, you can be direct, you can be honest about what you do, you can be honest about your shortcomings and gaps in your knowledge, you don't have to lie to be successful. And in fact, I took on um, that Jordan Belfort fellow from the Wolf of Wall Street. Who's familiar with the Wolf of Wall Street? Really? Yeah? 
this guy stole $200 million. $200 million from, from his clients. He's now reinvented himself as some kind of self-help guru, um, selling the same sorts of sales techniques that he used to con people out of $200 million. That kind of guy gives entrepreneurs like me and like all of you a really bad name. So a con is still a con, no matter what world or what city or what country you live in. So I wanted to say to people that this is not what we do, and this is not how we roll. So EntreHub was created off the back of it. So just quickly, I want to, to talk to you about some of the really important things that I've learned along the way. Seven things I tell my teenage self about entrepreneurship. Number one, procrastination is the root of all failure. You know, we sit down and we think, I've got this idea, but you know, oh, this is happening now, or that's happening now, or whatever's going on in my life. So don't procrastinate on sitting on an idea. I had an idea when I was a teenager, and it was with my little brother Michael, we just got this computer from Dick Smith, and we thought, well, let's do a travel blog. My God, I really kicked myself in the backside, because I think we could have been the first local planet. Seriously. So don't procrastinate over a really great idea. Try and bring it to life. The second is, you know what? Failure happens. I failed. Everybody fails. Get over it. It's okay to fail because through failure we learn some really big fundamental lessons. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Don't just run a bull at a gate. After you've got that idea, after you've committed to, I want to get this out of a piece of paper, know what's going on out in the market. So stop thinking and start writing it down. Don't think you know everything there is to know. There is no I in entrepreneur, okay? And by that I mean there are people that can help you along your journey. Even though you might be passionate about the idea, you may not know anything about raising capital. You may not know anything about social media engagement. So find those people that you can bring and draw around you that can make you more successful and I guarantee that they're sitting in this room today. Research if people even want what you've got. The biggest mistake I've learned in a couple of startups is I just thought my idea was so hot to trot that everybody would love it because I'm a very lovable chap. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> I was completely and utterly wrong because I'd also discovered that other people had already invented the idea that I thought I had. Um, so research what people want before you push the button. And the, the last thing that I, I would teach my teenage self is don't build it in the vain hope that they will come. You know, this whole nonsense about email and Facebook, I'm a big fan of Facebook, but pick up the phone, you know, communicate with people, go and engage with the audience. Don't think that just because you've built something, somebody's going to knock on your door and say, well, I'll have a bit of that, thanks. Because they won't. They don't know where to find you in a big, confusing, everybody's selling everything kind of world. So always know, don't build it um, and hope that they'll come to you. The next step, just quickly, the five things um, I will talk to you about leadership, and this is really important too, because leadership and entrepreneurship go hand in hand. Um, and this is all downloadable from our website too, so I'll give you a link. Um, so leaders don't sit in ivory towers. The biggest mistake in corporate Australia is all these white-haired men, and I'm going a little bit grey, but I'll fix it up with the in 2000 this weekend. <laughs> These old men sitting in their ivory towers somehow think that they've got enough on everything. Well, they don't. Leadership is about knowing what your people want, and this is why I talk about this thing as being very important. Leaders also know what they don't know. Uh, you know, Steve Wozniak and, uh, and Steve Jobs are so successful because Steve Jobs was the ultimate salesperson, visionary, and Steve Wozniak built stuff. You know, so again, coming back to what I said before, connect with people. Leaders encourage talent. I, when, when I was uh, about to leave Drake, I knew exactly who was going to be in my role. He was one of my general managers, and I thought he had the potential to be much better than me. Don't be afraid to nurture talent in the hope, because the hope is that they will take over from you and build it bigger and build it better. And I think that's a really important thing to understand. Leaders influenced by action. Don't sit around and talk about stuff. I do stuff because I fundamentally feel right from the very beginning that I can make a difference. And that's another important lesson. Nobody is incapable or unempowered to do something. You know, whether it be through cultural or religious beliefs, we all have the ability. And leaders know when it's also time to go. Um, and I'll give you five more, two more minutes. Leaders, <laughs> that's a lot more, isn't it? 
Let's also know when it's time to go. Just like we as successful entrepreneurs know when it's time to exit the business, sell, and move on to the next one. And I'll just quickly go through one more, and it's all about disruption. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of disruption. I just ignore it, I for a minute. Um, disruption is something that we've, uh, that we've lost in our lives. We somehow think, right, that we should do things through conventional methods and means. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to. You don't have to. I mean, look at me. I, I, I don't have really any other right to be here other than I thought, bugger, I'm going to get on that train. Everything else has been a methodical um, framework of desire to be successful. And that's really what I wanted to leave you with. There will be obstacles, there will be doubters, there will be mistakes, but with determination, perseverance, there is reward. And I guess this is what's informed me for all the things that I do today. Um, the United Nations Global Compact, when I was given the opportunity to do some reform there, I thought, bugger it, why not? Because I want people around the world to think like I do. That it's not acceptable for people to be in poverty. It's not acceptable to unempower people, whether they be women or people with disabilities or people from an indigenous background. So I wanted to take what I had and permeate that throughout the world, and that's what I did through my work with the United Nations Global Compact. The same with Suicide Prevention Australia. Why can't we have suicide in Australia by half within the decade? No one said that I couldn't do it, or we couldn't do it. And that's a mission statement based on our ethos for this TA today. And so it goes on and goes on. Um, but the nub and the hub of it is there is a lot of information and resources on the ultrahub.org website. All of those call cards, a bit of inspirational quotes, some video hits, 15 tips on how to build a business, um, and of course a whole lot of ebooks. Um, and then just finally, one more quote that you can read um, in your own time is from the beautiful and wonderful Maya Angelou. Who knows Maya? Was her, yeah, I mean, it, it, I've had her books before she became famous three weeks ago in Australia when she passed away. Now, Maya's backstory is, is much more severe than mine, but Maya came from absolute poverty in the deep south. I reckon she thought, bugger it too, why can't I be successful and do what I want to do? Um, and like me, she changed the circumstances that she was in. Now, I'm no Maya Angela, right? And I'm certainly not any of you. But what I would say to you is disrupt the hell out of convention. Um, the lessons about leadership and entrepreneurship are no different if you are black, white, gay, straight, Catholic, Christian, Muslim. It doesn't make any difference to me. Everybody has within them the fundamental opportunity to be successful.